Welcome to Jason Live. My name is Haley Nelson, and we are back with our STEM career series, where we learn about careers in science, technology, engineering, and math from role models in those fields. And today's STEM role model is Dr. Guillermo Caravantes, and he is a volcanologist. He's also the CEO of GeoArc Foundation, where he's working to record internal dynamics of a lava lake. He's building the first house that's able to withstand deadly pyroclastic flow called the Pyro House. Can't wait to talk to you about that one. And searching for new species in Central America in a crater. We're gonna learn all about our STEM role model and more when we connect with Guillermo in just a few moments. But first, I want to remind you that today's event is live and interactive. So if you're joining us from the Jason Learning website, there is a box right below this video window Winder video window where you can enter your questions and your comments and I will try to get to as many of them as possible so keep an ear out for your name and your question now's the time let's say hello to Guillermo hi there hi hello how are you doing well thank you so much for joining us what a topical week to get mm -hmm. to speak to you yeah I know it's topic. perfect yeah perfect timing right yeah yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. Well, we are going to get all into uh, you and why you study volcanoes and what that really means. Yeah. So let's go ahead and kick it right off. So as a volcanologist, you study volcanoes. Can you walk us through uh, Volcano 101 and what that means to what you study? All right. OK, so volcanoes are these amazing things. I study geology because, okay. well, First of all, I like the earth in general. I like mountains, but within that field, uh, volcanoes appeal the most to me because they are so active. They're always doing different things uh, and you can see them evolving over time with your own eyes. You don't have to wait millions of years. You know, you don't have to write down, uh, I don't know, look at fossil records. You can see them uh, breathing uh, life uh, in front of you. So that's why I decided to go for volcanoes. And there are these amazing things on the earth, which are both good and bad because you know they can be very dangerous of course as we are learning today in hawaii uh but at the same time they are also very beneficial in some respects you know uh very fertile soils come from volcanic ash for example uh you have the geotourism that comes associated with volcanoes so uh we need to learn learn more about them because at the moment you know we are still lacking some of knowledge well some knowledge to get to understand them better but yeah we're on our way let's say it's a very exciting career, it seems. We have a question from Elliot and mm -hmm. one from the Herrero Heroes, the Herrera Heroes at Clayton Elementary. Mm -hmm. It's a two for here. How does a volcano form? And have you ever explored an active volcano? All right. Okay. Good questions. Yeah, well, essentially a volcano forms uh, whenever there is an opening in the Earth's crust that allows the magma to come all the way from the from the mantle, essentially, and then come onto the surface of the Earth and start building things. So volcanoes can have like many different forms or shapes. Uh, they don't come like the typical cone you see in your drawings normally. Uh, you, you can have like the fissures we see on Hawaii today. Uh, you can have massive calderas, which are like depressions where uh, lava and magma comes up. Uh, but yeah, it's essentially that's the idea. There is a, an opening in the Earth's surface and that allows material, molten material to come all the way up. So that's a volcano and I have, yes, I have studied uh, active volcanoes for the last 12 years. I have been working mainly in Central America, also in Italy, uh, but my favorite volcano in the world is uh, Masaya Volcano in Nicaragua, which is a fantastic volcano. There is a lava lake at the top. Uh, and, and very interesting features. And that's the one I have concentrated on and dedicated most, most time to. Ooh, I can't wait to ask more questions about these lava lakes. I'm sure they're gonna be rolling in. We have a question from Alex who wonders, what is the landscape of the inside of a volcano? All right, okay, that's also a very good question. And one that not many people know the answer to because it's very difficult to get into volcanoes, right? Just because of the hazards associated. So. Uh, normally, I would describe it, you know, as a lunar landscape, pretty much. It's a very barren land, so uh, yeah, very desertic. Uh, normally, vegetation takes a while, a long while, to develop in these areas. So it it feels very strange uh, to humans, <laughs> just because we are not used to this type of landscape in general, uh, except for, of course, uh, people who live on top of volcanoes, like you know, Hawaii, for example. But, yeah. Well, this is, this is a good question here coming right after that. Marcus wants to know, 
why did Mount Kilauea erupt? All right, yeah, that's that's a very good question for me and for everyone, <laughs> to be honest. Um, <laughs> well, I'm not an expert in Kilauea. Uh, I have my colleagues at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory for that, so I would recommend that you go on the USGS website, the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory website, and check the latest updates, because uh, those are the people who know more about this volcano in particular. Uh, but essentially what happens is when there is pressure uh, coming from below, uh, then there is a higher chance of an eruption, essentially. If you have both uh, things that you need for an eruption, so opening uh, crust, uh, well, fissures, things like this, and at the same time you have an increase in pressure, eruptions will happen. In this case, it seems like it is associated also with the emptying or the draining of a lava lake uh, or, or the Halema mouth, uh, mouth. And, and then it did, that uh, drainage is pushing the lava in a different direction, following a fissure all the way down. Uh, again, I'm not an expert, but yeah, that, that's what seems to be happening at the moment. So a fissure is like kind of just like a tiny little crack that may have other little splintered off little cracks. Tiny or not so tiny. Sometimes, you know, it can be like kilometers long, uh, sometimes quite wide. Uh, in Iceland, they are very familiar with this uh, because they do get these cartons of lava every now and then, eruptions which are very spectacular, uh, but also dangerous because you have along a line of maybe 10 kilometers or 15 kilometers, you have a carton of lava that could be uh, flowing down into your towns. Or So it is a dangerous thing, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's also a beautiful thing. I agree. We have a comment from, oh, Hopewell Crest School. Catalina wants to know, What's the most exciting thing about what is happening with the volcanoes in Hawaii to you? Hi, Catalina. <laughs> well, in, in this case, it's particularly exciting because it's a very good analog. So a very good comparison can be established between uh, the Hawaiian volcanoes and the volcano in Nicaragua, which is the one I study. Both of them have a lava lake, first of all. Both of them are uh, have a lot of fractures associated to them. And that is what I did with my PhD, study the fractures within Masaya volcano. Uh, and there is a likelihood of those fractures being able to conduct the lava coming all the way to the surface. So we can learn from Hawaii lessons that then we can apply somewhere else. And this has been the case for, well, many eruptions in the US actually. The, the eruption of Mount St. Helens uh, taught us some uh, very important things about volcanoes that the volcanologists around the world apply to their volcanoes locally. So. Yeah, that's the most exciting thing for me about Hawaii is learning how uh, it can work and then apply it to Masaya in Nicaragua. Well, we have someone asking very similar to what you just said, uh, but a slightly different L Grand Slammer wants to know what's the difference of the different volcanoes like the Hawaii one and the one you're working on? Okay, all right. Yeah, <laughs> there are a lot of similarities. I would say that the one I'm working on, uh, it's known because even though the lava is quite fluid, like the one in Hawaii, so it kind of flows downhill, at the same time, there were huge eruptions in the past, very explosive eruptions uh, that put a lot of ash in the air and then eventually uh, well, covered a large area of Nicaragua. So one of the interesting things about this volcano, Masaya volcano in particular, is that it displays all these different types of eruptions, uh, which is not a common thing in the world in general. So if, we have, if you ever watch uh, what's uh, the film Dante's Peak, or, well, it's essentially a volcano like that, that displays all these different types of activity. So you have, so it's a volcano um, where it could blow. It's got that really thick lava like Mount, Haines, Mount St. Helens had. And then it's also got that really easy flowing like Mauna Loa or Kilauea. It's very well, they, interesting. Yeah, it's very interesting and, and hard to figure out, to be honest, at this point. I mean, the lava we have uh, on top of the, of the volcano, essentially, is all pretty much the same composition over time. So we still don't know what exactly triggers these huge eruptions. And this is one of the reasons to study the volcano, right? Because at this moment, we don't know the mechanism behind it. So massive that challenge. But... Really good to know. <laughs> yes, I agree. Yeah. Um, Maddox would like to know what materials do you bring with you on your expect uh, on your expeditions? Uh, this is Mrs. Duquette's seventh grade class, mm -hmm. and Jordan wants to know. Uh, also has a question about your equipment. All right. Okay. So we bring uh, a number of instruments. Like for example, I think you can see in the picture at the moment, uh, gravimeters are one of our main tools. So we use them to measure gravity which means the acceleration in a particular location. Uh, and we use that to understand the density uh, underneath our volcano. 
Uh, that is, of course, something that you can apply immediately to things like magma chambers, for example, right? So magma chambers, the magma itself will have a different density to the surrounding rock. So if we can measure over a large area uh, with many different, well, with an instrument many different times, then eventually we can compile a map that will tell us something about where the magma sits in depth. That's one of the, the things we do with these instruments. But we use a range of them. I mean, uh, gravimeters, magnetometers, anything that will let us know something about the state of the crust at that particular location, we use. And then also the common things like GPS, handheld GPSs, or, uh, you know, uh, pocket knives, you know, the, the usual stuff for the pill. But that's, it, it has to be a, the right combination of both things, specialized instruments and Hmm. Are you are you dropping uh, the gravimeters into the lava lake? Or are you using it in the areas surrounding it? I'm using it in the area surrounding because uh, my colleagues would kill me actually because they are pretty expensive. So uh, it's uh, some of them can be many tens of thousands of dollars. So we just use them. We we walk with them in our backpacks. Then we place them on a particular location. We measure the value of gravity at that location. Then we move to the next point, perhaps 100 meters from that one. We measure again. Then over time, we start compiling well, many different points together. And with that, we make a map. OK. And, and, just, and what does that tell you? That gives us an information on what's the state of the, um, of the geology underneath, essentially. So if there is magma, for example, uh, we will be able to detect where the magma is. And if we correlate uh, the location of the magma chambers, the magma reservoirs were uh, with the fractures on the surface, we can start to say where we can expect an absorption. That's the idea. Okay, so you're yeah. mapping where things could possibly come to the surface. Yes. Okay, wow. Okay, yes, that's incredible. That's Okay, gravimeters. That's but, cool. I, I don't know what those are. Mm -hmm. Actually, we, we do other things as well, like these gravimeters, for example. We can also uh, place them on top of the volcano, like near the lava lake, not on the lava lake, and then release them, and then they will measure continuously over time. And they will also be uh, giving us um, a signal of how likely it is an eruption in the future. You know, so if magma is coming, you expect a change, perhaps an increase in your gravity values, and then eventually you can tell civil protection and they can get prepared. In advance. Wow, cool tools. Yeah. We have a question from New Richmond Elementary um, wondering uh, these sixth graders would like to know what types of technology you use to stay safe while you're studying the volcanoes. And this one is also linked up here. Have you, and Herrera Heroes, they want to know have you ever been burned by a rock on a volcano? Michael particularly wants to know that. All right, okay. So uh, yeah, rock having, having been burned by a, a rock at the, on a volcano, not really, except for those who were very hot from from steam sometimes that comes off the ground. So you do have to be careful. Uh, but when you see the steam coming off the ground, you already know, so you kind of move away from them. Uh, sorry, what was the first question? It was um, um, they want to know what type, types of technology you yes, use to sorry. stay safe while you're there. Yeah. Okay. So the main one I would say is the communication. You need to be in touch with your team uh, at all times, because otherwise, you know, uh, yeah, huge risks can come of bad communications. You need to know where everyone is, uh, if there was anyone in danger, especially in areas which we know can be can be dangerous. Uh, so we have radios at all times with us, mobile phones, uh, and normally we try to keep a uh, visual contact between members of the team so that we know that everyone is doing okay. At the same time, we also have uh, direct communication with. Uh, the geophysical institutions in the country always, which means that we are always tuned in into the last seismic activity, for example. So if something is about to happen, we might get a warning in advance as well. Mm. Um, and at the same time, it is a lot about uh, visual observations. You need to be very aware of the environment uh, surrounding you, because uh, these places, I mean, even if nothing is happening regarding to the volcano, you can very easily trip and fall into a crater. So you need to be very aware of that. Good to know. <laughs> um, we have a question from the LMS science class wondering, did you go into volcanoes alone or do you go with other people? Always with other people, yes. Because I'm, I'm definitely, no, I'm, and I would say no volcanologist is a superhero. Uh, the only thing we're trying to do is to uh, put teams together with the right skills that will be able to problems that uh, are interesting because they will help us improve the safety of the population. So it's nothing to do with being a hero. It's, it's more to do with having smart strategies uh, to be able to tackle scientific problems the same way that any other scientist does. 
Uh, the only thing is that well, there are some particularities to the environment here. Like being able to survive on a really hot moon. <laughs> yeah, for example. <laughs> Stella would like to know, and um, oh, here's some, these are, these are uh, pyro house questions. Mm -hmm. okay. So we have one from Sela and one from <laughs> Samara from um, Leicester Middle School and um, Mount View Middle School. They'd, what, they'd like to know for future city members, how would the pyro house work and what materials are the houses, what will they be made out of? All right. Yes, we are in the development stage. This is a fantastic idea. It came uh, up uh, at a meeting with some colleagues, which are architects and industrial engineers. And uh, we essentially uh, just figured out that for some people living near volcanoes, it's impossible to protect themselves from pyroclastic flows. They cannot run away from them because they are too fast. So 500 kilometers per hour or 700. So it's, uh, it's, it is, yeah, like 300, 400 uh, miles per hour. So they're just, too fast, you cannot outrun them. Uh, most people living nearby volcanoes like these do not have the resources to have a plane or a helicopter. So the only thing you can do is to protect yourself while you know the eruption is going on. So we started working on this idea and uh, the, the basic idea is that there will be a unit which is very safe inside like a bunker type thing that will protect uh, you from the from the first uh, shock wave which is the main danger from this uh, type of eruption and then eventually will help you stay alive for the 20 30 40 minutes that you need until the cloud dissipates and these very high temperatures because you know it can get up to four or five hundred degrees uh, around the house uh, also dissipates and then you can come out and, and call for help and be rescued so yeah materials wise uh, that's something that we are working on at the moment so Please, uh, if you have any ideas, you're welcome to enter the Georg Foundation website, go to contact us and send us your ideas. We'll be delighted to have them. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it seems like a very promising project, actually. Wow, okay, so it's gonna protect people from the initial pyroclastic eruption that happens, and then they have a certain amount of air to keep them safe. How do they get out? How how is that still under, is that still being figured out? No, we, we are going to build this uh, with a geometry, taking into account the slope uh, of the volcano itself, taking into account the geometry of the house itself. Uh, we are going to make sure that uh, whatever ash deposits in the area is not going to block the exit. Uh, but it is one of the challenges we face. And there are not just one, there are many of them, because of course uh, you have that, but, uh, but you also have the earthquakes in the area. Uh, you have massive winds uh, as well. Some, sometimes after the pyroclastic flow, uh, you can have tornadoes following them. So it is a massive multi-problem, really, uh, we're trying to solve here. Uh, but it seems like yeah, we're on the right path, let's say. I am so excited that you're working yeah. on this. That seems to be <laughs> a lot of what you do is working on really tough scientific questions that yeah. don't have answers yet. So I'm all yeah. for that. <laughs> We've got Sawyer, who is wondering, what material are you going to use for your safe house for the lava production? Okay. Any ideas there? And Mrs. Duquette, seventh grade class at Tripp Middle School has that question. And also Swizzy would like to know, um, how would you get inside the pyro house if it were surrounded by lava? Okay, all right. So how to get inside the pyro house? The idea is that we will also have, we will feed the house uh, with warning systems, with early warning systems that will let people know in advance that activity or a pyroclastic flow is coming so that they have the time well, in this case, it's going to be inside their own house, so they don't have to go too far. They just need to go to get to the bunker and be able to get in, uh, lock the safe, and make sure they, they stay there for the duration of the eruption. Uh, regarding materials, we are speaking with different construction companies on different uh, compositions of even concrete, which is going to be to the grade that it can resist these temperatures. Uh, but yeah, again, this is uh, under discussion at the moment because we have like two or three different, uh, three different ways we can go and we haven't decided just yet. Wow, this is so exciting. Um, sixth grade at Ashford School would like to know how far along are you on the pyro house? Okay, yeah, good question. Yes, we are, uh, I would say, uh, at phase one, so we're uh, running the simulations at the moment and well, trying with all these different compositions for uh, building the pyro house itself. We are uh, at trying to complete a full simulation that will prove that the, uh, the idea is actually feasible. And then eventually we will move into phase two. 
Uh, and phase two means, uh, well, building uh, a model of the biohouse or at least the bunker in an area which is uh, prone to pyroclastic flows and seeing how well it does uh, and if it can resist uh, and protect people from, from this type of activity. So, yeah, phase one, uh, heading for phase two. All right. And is it going to be designed to have people live there full time or is it a, a designed kind of like a like a tornado shelter? It is. It, yeah, uh, we are trying to make it uh, in a way that will not only resist the pyroclastic flow itself, but will also survive in time so that people can still live with minimal uh, minimal repairs, essentially, because what we are trying to do is we're trying to address this to essentially developing countries where people sometimes don't have the resources to uh, to tackle these challenges and rebuild the house from scratch. So the more we can preserve out of the house uh, and the less they have to do to uh, leave again in the area if necessary, if they decide they don't want to move somewhere else after a pyroclastic flow, which, you know, <laughs> there are some open questions. Uh, but yeah, uh, the more it can resist, the better. Wonderful. That takes into account so many more things than just the materials themselves, yeah, people who are living. Right. Um, uh, Afram, who would like to know, how would you tell if a volcano is active? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Normally, uh, volcanologists divide uh, volcanoes into uh, in different states. So you say, well, dormant volcano is a volcano that can potentially reactivate, uh, but is not likely to do so in the near future. Then you have active volcanoes. But to be honest, this is uh, every time we try to uh, set up a line or a boundary, uh, it is a natural system. So it is a continuous system. It's really hard to say, well, up to when exactly the volcano can be considered inactive forever. Uh, because it depends a lot on the chemistry of the volcano. Some volcanoes can remain inactive for hundreds of years and then in a heartbeat come back alive and, and do something surprising. Uh, so essentially anything that displays any sort of activity, uh, so for example, any uh, steam coming off the ground will give you an indication that the system is still active. There is energy within the system, thermal energy, so you can expect activity in the future as well. Ooh, exciting. Anything <laughs> can happen. Yeah, I mean. it's like it's like Earth is alive or something. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's like <laughs> um, Hunter's Creek Elementary. They'd like to know: Are the species you find in a volcano plants or animals too? And um, Mrs. Uh, Negrin's gate class in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, Alec would like to know: Have you ever found fossils in a volcano? So the species you find are they plants or animals? And have you found fossils? All right. So, well, plants or animals? Yeah, definitely. You can have uh, things on volcanoes which are not normal to the environment where they sit. And this is why we're interested in going to volcanoes to study these species. One of our expeditions is actually designed to go to, to Nicaragua and uh, near uh, the open active crater that we discussed before, Masaya Volcano in Nicaragua. And this one will address a crater that's nearby, which is always affected by gases. Uh, and that means that there are some mutations or some adaptations to the well to the um, uh, the plant species or the animal species uh, so it is possible that we can learn from them uh, how they adapt it and then we can apply this to our own survival or to the survival of our plants plant species in the area as well so potentially we could be giving advice to local farmers on how to protect their crops using some of the strategies that we find in the species that adapt to volcanoes so there are yeah there are adaptations for sure because these environments can be very extreme sometimes um, regarding fossils normally in most volcanoes you don't find fossils because uh, uh, i mean uh, of course they tend to be very recent you can have very ancient volcanoes as well and some activities uh, like for example lahars that come down from them uh, and then they cover uh, plant species or animal species and they can be preserved in time but i would say it's not the ideal location to look for fossils you cover so many different areas of science with your career you've got the biology side you've got the engineering side obviously your your geology it seems like what you do touches on so many things and is that just because of the the human interaction aspect of life it's, with volcanoes it is the nature of volcanoes it's so essentially we're just looking at the system that is alive it's open and it encompasses all these different elements so you have all the plant species and animal species living on them you have the humans living nearby so there are uh, hazard implications 
so you have also the human, the social sciences aspect. Uh, you have, of course, you have to tackle the volcano itself and understand uh, what's happening with the activity. Can you predict it? Uh, so, yeah, it is a combination of many different things, which is why volcanology is really a multidisciplinary science. It's uh, you cannot tackle uh, any uh, any big problem like this one without being able to count with experts from many different fields, and that is reflected in every expedition we do. Uh, we have biologists and we have uh, engineers and we have uh, rope access technicians and we have geologists and volcanologists and uh, social scientists as well. So, yeah, without that component, it's really difficult to tackle any volcanology problem. Volcanology problem problems are a party. <laughs> we heard it here. <laughs> um, um, Isis, Abigail, and Arden, they are Herrera's heroes. Shout out to Herrera's heroes. Woo -woo. Uh, they want to know how long have you been a volcanologist? I've been a volcanologist uh, for the last 10 years. I mean, I got my PhD in, uh, only five years ago. Uh, goodness, five years ago already, yes. So, um, yeah, it's been a relatively short career, uh, but then I studied uh, before that. I was also doing geology for a number of years. And you do need to study for any of this. I mean, I'm sure any of your guests would say the same. You do need a number of years of study before you can become uh, a proper volcanologist. So I would say yeah, I've been doing volcanology for the last 10 years. Wow, that's that's so wonderful. And you have all this other other information and other studies behind that too. Rachel mm -hmm. wants to know, when did you first find out that you loved geology? Like what was your journey into your passion for geology? And Raya wants to know, is geology an easy study to sub or easy subject to study? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I essentially I found my way uh, because when I was a kid, I used to go to the mountains in Spain every year, pretty much. Uh, to a little town called Benasque, which is very, very nice, is very beautiful landscape, uh, wonderful mountains, all covered with snow. And I was very curious. I, I couldn't understand how these massive things got there, actually. So uh, I was always walking through the through all these paths and, and having all these different questions. And then eventually, when it was time for me, I my first, I mean, I, I wanted to be a psychiat psychiatrist for 17 years. But in the last year, I just discovered that geology was really the career path. For me. So I just switched. I uh, went into geology and yeah, uh, here I am. And yeah, it's been, uh, it, it's not a massively difficult career in itself. I, the only thing I think is with everything really, you have to like it. If you like it, if you have passion for it, yes, you know, you, you, you'll you be fine, essentially. You'll chase your dreams, you'll find out, you know, the information you need. Uh, you'll read apart from what you have, you know, from your courses, they give you nice material, but if you can read something else to inform yourself, to understand, to get familiar with your topic, uh, that's going to give you an edge and essentially that's going to uh, allow you to go into geology or volcanology whatever you want i was not expecting the jump from psychology to geology yeah. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah yeah i'm much happier i think <laughs> um isabella would like to know uh from gate idaho what was your favorite subject in school and we've got another double question here um We've got Yoidel who would like to know what classes in high school and college are necessary when you want to work with volcanoes. So what's your favorite and then what are some necessary classes? So my favorite classes were two. Uh, one of them was English actually when I was a kid uh, and I'm not sure you can tell because I have a very thick accent still but uh, I really loved English. Uh, and then geology. I ended up really liking uh, the subject of geology because it was very varied there were so many different things inside it and i could you know my mind could travel uh with the words of the book so uh, i would say those were my two favorite subjects but the ones you do need to get into at some point sooner rather than later are anything that's that has to do with maths or uh, physics uh chemistry so those are very important especially these three are, are very important uh, for geology Having said that, I wasn't great <laughs> at uh, a couple of them, and I still made it to be a volcanologist. So don't be discouraged. If at some point uh, you, you find out that something is not working one year for you, uh, you know, keep working on it until you get past it, because eventually your mind will develop as well and will be able to, to tackle uh, bigger challenges. And, and over time, uh, you can become anything you want. So yeah, that's my advice, humble advice. I like that advice. We have Azalea. Uh, Azalea would like to know, 
where was the first place you visited and studied? Um, that's Mrs. Duquette's class. And um, let's see, we've got Amaya from Mrs. Duguay's class would like to know, oh, okay, so where was the first place that you've studied? And then follow up, how many countries have you visited in your career? All right, good question, especially. Yeah, uh, so the first one, the place where I started my career was in, in Italy. I went to do a scholarship by the end of my, well, in Spain, the degree is five years. So in my fifth year, I went to Italy, uh, to Pisa, and I was doing some volcanology studies in, in Pisa, well, near Pisa, essentially. And it was a subvolcanic body. So it wasn't a, a volcano, but I was already very happy because I was touching rocks, which were, you know, magmatic, essentially, in nature. So that was the first area I visited uh, as a career. Um, and then in my well, in my career, how many countries I visited, I have no idea. I, I think it's something around like 40 or something, but I wouldn't be able to, to pinpoint an exact number, to be honest. I haven't counted them. And where, where would be your favorite place that you've gone? Could, does that come to mind? Yeah, goodness. <laughs> that was also a good question. Um, I mean, only from the amount of times I've, I've been to, I think it would have to be Masaya in Nicaragua. Because it's not only the volcano itself, it's the exciting stuff that's happening around it. You know, it's the, yeah, the lava lake and the fractures and everything. But then it's the people in the country. They are so open and so well, so welcoming uh, that uh, you want to go back to the country over and over. And I've been going back uh, for the last, last 10 years pretty much every year. But then, you know, I also have other favorite places like Colima Volcano in Mexico is, is fantastic. Uh, Etna Volcano in, in Italy is just wonderful because it's, you know, sitting in the middle of a plane and you can see the clouds building up in front of you. So it's, yeah, it's hard to select one. <laughs> I can imagine, especially places with such immense beauty and interest for you. Yeah. Layla uh, at Westbriar would like to know, this is a fifth grader, Layla would like to know, what is your best encounter with volcanoes and your worst? Okay, so my best encounter with volcanoes, um, sorry to keep referring back to Masaya, but the lava lake that we have at the moment, and there are only a few lava lakes in the world. So active lava lakes, there are only at one given time, like six or seven. Uh, and this is one of them at the moment. And we suspected there was a lava lake uh, in depth, but we couldn't see it for, well, the last 25 years. Uh, and in, in 2015, when I, well, 2016 yeah, actually, when I thought I would never see it in Masaya, eventually the lava lake resurfaced and I could see uh, an active lava lake for the first time in my life. So that was a very special moment. Uh, and the fact it happened in the volcano I had been studying for all these years made it extra special. So yeah, I would say that was, yeah, that was very, very nice of the volcano. I was very happy. Um, and then the worst uh, moment in a volcano, I think it was in Costa Rica which is uh, another volcano I've studied, uh, Boas Volcano in Costa Rica. There was an earthquake in, in 2009, I think, yes, uh, the Cinchona earthquake. And then uh, I was studying the volcano at the time, and I was with my supervisor at the moment and a bunch of colleagues, and we were inside the crater. And uh, a 6.5 earthquake hit the area uh, right underneath uh, the crater itself. Um, and then, well, we were quite scared, to be honest, because, you know, the whole volcano was shaking uh, up and down. We were not sure if an eruption was incoming. Uh, but the worst part is, even with that, we were still excited, but then we got out of the volcano and then 63 people had been killed. So that was, an, that was uh, a bad moment, really. Wow, what, a, what an experience to go through something so beautiful and, and so deadly. Yes. Um, Ms. Hardinger's class would like to, Dylan wants to know, is, is a volcano the most dangerous thing on earth? Are they more dangerous than storms like tornadoes and hurricanes? And a uh, follow up to that, Jane Hayden at, uh, and Hayden at Meadows Elementary would like to know, uh, can volcanoes cause storms? Okay, yeah, interesting. So. I'm going to root for my science here, and I'm going to say yes, uh, the volcanoes can be the most dangerous thing on Earth. Uh, and the reason I'm saying this is because we have uh, a thing called super volcano, like the one you guys have in Yellowstone, uh, for example. Another one in Italy, in uh, Campi Fregre, there is another one in New Zealand. So these super volcanoes uh, are known for doing these huge eruptions, and if they do, eventually they can put in the air a massive amount of ash. 
and the danger is not only for people who live nearby, which of course is very dangerous, uh, but also for the rest of the globe, because if this ash gets into the atmosphere and then it's transported all over the world, it can potentially block the sun. Uh, so that could cause uh, plants to die from lack of uh, sunshine, essentially, and not being able to do the photosynthesis. So, it, yeah, they're definitely dangerous, and we definitely need to keep an eye on them. Um, so, yeah, I would say. And sorry, the second question was? Uh, um, it was also, uh, can volcanoes cause storms? Yes, okay. So I would say that in general, massive storms, not so much. Uh, like, for example, the hurricanes you get in the Atlantic uh, every now and then. Those things are, can hardly be caused by volcanic eruptions, but you can have uh, weather phenomena associated to, to eruptions. So, like, for example, I mentioned before that uh, after pyroclastic flows, uh, the ground is so hot, uh, then tornadoes can form, and then they can kind of drag behind uh, the pyroclastic flow and cause it even more devastation or more damage than was already in, in place. Uh, apart from that, you also have other type of activity, which is called, well, essentially it's the electrical activity associated with the ash particles being in the air. Many of these uh, ash particles can have metallic content, and then there is electrical imbalance uh, between the atmosphere and the ground. So you can have also electrical storms associated with volcanoes. So when there are big eruptions, yeah, <laughs> lots of things happen. It's, it's hard to keep an eye on all of them, actually. <laughs> okay. Aside from the possible damage that all of that can do, that is so cool. <laughs> a yeah, fire right. plastic flow followed by a tornado that's got electrical activity going yeah. on in it. That sounds like something that would happen on a Pokemon episode. That's I know, amazing. yes. <laughs> yeah, there is a really cool video from Merapi Volcano that you guys can check online. Uh, and it, you can see precisely that. You can see the pyroclastic flow and after that, the, the tornadoes following it. So it's, yeah. It's quite I mean, a spectacular. I am definitely going to check that out. Okay. Yeah. We have more questions, of course. Um, Jeremiah from Hopewell wants to know what's the best thing about your job? And then um, Maya would like to know what do you find the most interesting or fun thing about being a volcanologist? And uh, she's a Mrs. Duquette's seventh grade class. So, what's the best thing and what's the most fun thing about being yeah. a volcanologist? So, so the best thing, uh, the best thing I think is that everything we do uh, is aiming towards helping people. So we are not doing something that's completely apart from society, or you know we forget or neglect society, but we are doing something that we believe in time is going to bring the right answers, and we can improve people's safety. Uh, and that is also very rewarding as well, because you know you have. Uh, all these very close interactions with people who live um, in, in the area and that are normally very concerned about the volcano. They hear stories, uh, sometimes they are true, sometimes they are not. Uh, so you do, have, you do get the chance uh, to explain uh, a little bit better what's happening with their volcano. And local people are amazing. They are not only a source of knowledge, uh, which is fantastic, that no volcanologist should ever neglect. Uh, but they are also more interested than anyone in knowing what's happening with the volcano. So uh, that's pretty good. And regarding the most, well, the, the most fun thing uh, having to do with volcanoes, I think part of it is the excitement. I cannot uh, hide this, you know, because it's it's also part of, of the whole thing. It's, it's very exciting to go into a place that uh, perhaps uh, not too many people have been to and, and be able to to look at these massive or incredibly beautiful phenomena uh, and study them. You know, it's uh, it's very rewarding. And I think the example I, I gave you before uh, was a good example. You know, having this lava lake we're surfacing uh, with uh, no one uh, having seen it uh, for for years and years in Masaya, that was a very good experience. So, all yeah. right, we're coming with you. Yeah, good. And we're all invited. So, How many people, more or less, so I can accommodate you? How many people? Um, at least three here <laughs> okay. in this room, and then <laughs> perhaps everybody watching. Can you take a couple right. thousand with you? Well, perhaps, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, we have a, a question from Mrs. Um, Schlobaum's class <coughs> in Fremont, California. Do you have any family members that are volcanologists or that work in a similar field? Okay. No, actually not. Uh, all my, well, most of my family members are actually social scientists, pretty much all of them. And I'm the old ball in the in the group. You know, I decided to go to geology because I liked it. But everything I had been taught since I was a kid was uh, had to do with social sciences. 
So it was it was interesting for my parents and my sister, who, uh, who is also a, a social scientist. It was interesting to see me going down this career path. You know, it makes a lot of sense because <clears throat> in what you do, you did choose something where you can connect the dots very easily from the science that you do to how it helps the people around you. There's no, it's not like, oh, I study this very tiny plant that could go extinct and then you have to like really connect the dots to help people understand. People yeah. understand this immediately. Yeah, yeah, you got me, yes. Cool. It's kind, kind of lucky. <laughs> Grant writing is pretty straightforward, I suppose. <laughs> um, Teresa would like to know, Teresa is from Mrs. Robertson's seventh grade class. She'd like to know, in the past few years, we hear more about eruptions than in the, in the past. Is this activity increasing, and do you believe it will continue to increase? No, well, I would say that um, even though we get more and more news regarding volcanic eruptions, normally it has to do with the fact that uh, we are in a very well-connected society, increasingly better connected society, so we get news from all over the world in an instant now. Uh, and before that wasn't the case, you know, perhaps a volcanic eruption uh, in the 1670, which is one of the eruptions in Messiah, happened that year and then it wasn't reported back in Europe until a few years later, essentially, when the people that saw it came back. So as as we, you know, the, the global connectivity uh, increases, we are going to see more and more of this, but that doesn't mean that volcanic activity per se is increasing. Uh, and so far there are a, a number of studies and it is, we don't find any correlation uh, with, you know, time passing by and more activity going on. Okay, are you, uh, are you worried about any super volcanoes? Uh, I'm always worried about super volcanoes because <laughs> if they're up, we're in big trouble. Uh, but no, not at the moment. Like it's uh, there, there is nothing that indicates that something is about to happen. Like we have absolutely no no signal or no indication uh, that something might be about to happen. And to be honest, we do have in well in all three of these well or on on all super volcanoes, we do have really good professionals uh, studying the terrain. So I think if something starts happening, we are going to know fairly soon. Uh, like in Yellowstone, you guys have uh, fantastic teams uh, from the USDS working there. We have well, some of the best volcanologists in the world work in Italy around this other super volcano in New Zealand as well. So they're re relatively well monitored. That's a good. That's a good thought. It's nice mm -hmm. to know. Yes. <laughs> okay. uh, Mrs. Krimmel has an intermediate class. They want to know what is the safest distance to be from an active volcano. Emerson okay. would like to know in Miss Griffin's class. All right. Um, it does depend a lot on which type of volcano it is. Some of them you can, I mean, you've seen people, I'm sure you'll have seen uh, people in Hawaii uh, walking close to, to lava flows going downhill. And a bit, well, even though you have always to follow the indications from uh, officials in the area, um, that's something that's not too unsafe to do. But no, okay, let, let's just remove that from the record. <laughs> I just follow uh, the indications from security officials in the area, uh, but it does depend a lot. You know, so like some of these um, lava flows coming downhill, uh, you can just walk away from them. But sometimes massive explosions, you just cannot. Uh, which is why, for example, the power house. You know, is is the reason behind the power house. So it does change a lot from place to place, and you have to understand what the activity of the volcano was in the past for you to venture anywhere near. Uh, like for example, you know. Um, if you uh, look at the deposits or read what scientists have done in the area and you discover that uh, explosion deposits have been uh, traveling as far as 20 kilometers, you shouldn't get closer than that because there is a chance that it might happen again and you might be affected. So it is massively dependent on the type of volcano really. Or even uh, walking on something that doesn't look like it's active could have <laughs> lava tubes flowing underneath it that you could fall yeah. through. So much to think about. Um, Asher yeah. from Hopewell wants to know, what's your favorite hobby besides working with volcanoes? Uh, Hunter also wants to know, he's from Miss Furway's class, what's your favorite hobby? My favorite hobby, okay. Um, I'm, I really like climbing, over the, uh, uh, even though I haven't done it for, for a couple of years now, uh, but I, I really like climbing and I'm now uh, in GeoArc. Uh, I have associated with a bunch of guys which are not only rope access technicians, but also uh, climbers. So I think I'm going to have the chance to go back into that uh, fairly soon. Uh, but then I like the outdoors in general, to be honest. So uh, hiking, even if it's not volcanoes, you know, in the mountains, uh, being outdoors, uh, all that really appeals to me. 
because uh, I, I mean, nature is beautiful. So I, I do enjoy very much being outside in many different places. I have never visited the U.S. for that. So I hope I can I can go one day. Well, we have Gordon. Uh, well, no, it's Gordon School, seventh grade. In the picture about you, it looks like you're climbing into an active volcano in regular clothes. Besides the gloves and the mask, what other protective gear do you wear? How were you able to get so close? Okay, yeah, good question. And um, yeah, that gives me the chance to explain that picture because, uh, so, all right, okay. Um, I'm not sure if it was the one in Austria. Uh, so the one in Austria, um, this one wasn't an active volcano. It was just doing some climbing with friends. Um, and I was, it was just a, a via ferrata. So it's, uh, uh, you have these installations, you know, and you can kind of climb over walls uh, for people who are not, uh, that much of an expert in climbing. So I wasn't near an active volcano. I would never go to an active volcano like this. Uh, that's a pretty bad idea. Uh, short sleeves and short uh, well, pants, essentially, it's a bad idea in general. Uh, normally, when you get close to active volcanoes, you do need a bunch of protective gear. I would say the key one, um, or the, the two key pieces of equipment are the gas masks, especially when you're uh, working on volcanoes, which have a lot of degassing. And then the other thing is the helmet, because you can always expect something coming either from rock falls or from the volcano itself, uh, kind of coming up and then coming down on you. So anytime you get close to an active volcano, uh, you should wear well, both things. And then, yeah, good clothes as well. All right. We are down to our last question. And this is our Easter egg question that has been asked in every live event we have done. <laughs> Parker and uh, Vedant want to know, they're part of the Herrera Heroes, they want to know what do you prefer, pancakes or waffles? <laughs> and that is, okay, that's good you to know. You thought you were gonna get. <laughs> yeah. I, would say, I would say pancakes, but I'm going to give you a reason. Uh, if you check online, uh, there is a, a, a thing called pancake domes in Venus, which are volcanic uh, structures. And they are just beautiful. So if you check Pancake Domes online, Venus, uh, they are just fantastic, which is why I think I would love for pancakes. <laughs> That's my reason. <laughs> you are the only person who would choose pancakes for that reason. <laughs> certain. And for our viewers out there, <laughs> if you would like to see whether our team prefers pancakes or waffles, you should stay tuned to our social media today because we are leaving here, this is our, our last Alive event of the season. Right. And if you stay tuned, you'll see what we what we happen to prefer. Okay, but unfortunately, I can't believe this hour has gone by so fast. Yeah. We are out of time. Um, Guillermo, thank you so much for coming and sharing your story. We could do this all day with you. <laughs> my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Oh my gosh, we'll do it again some other time. Um, <laughs> and, um, We've got, this This concludes our, our last live event of the season, but fear not, you can follow along with the Argonaut ex, uh, expeditions this summer. So you can see students and teachers just like you who are going to really cool destinations, studying sea turtles in the Bahamas in June and studying the changing wildlife in the Andorran Pyrenees in August, you can follow on. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and teachers, whether you're an experienced Jason veteran or you're brand new to the Jason curriculum, the Jason National Conference is in Virginia at the end of June. And it's the perfect place that you can team up with fellow educators and you can tackle super tricky aspects of science teaching and learning and go into the fall being more inspired than ever. So for more information on that, of course, you go to jason.org and and we'll miss you, we'll miss you all. So stop by, drop by on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter and say hi and see what is going to be coming up and some of the behind the scenes things that we do when we're not going live with you. Until then, from Jason Learning, I'm Haley Nelson and we'll see you next time on Jason Live.